Well, greetings, future social workers. Welcome back to Case Management 535. I am super excited for our lessons day, and I hope you are too. Uh, so what we're gonna be talking about today is we're gonna be moving into, um, or discussing more about the second phase of the GEM model, which refers to planning, okay? And I'm excited today for our lesson because we're gonna also be able to dive a little deeper into what it means to prepare a case plan, and particularly uh, in relationship to your wraparound training to prepare a plan of care, which is essentially what we refer to as a case plan in the wraparound world. And so we're gonna be able to talk a little bit about the specifics related to identifying needs and strategies on a case plan that you will be generating, okay? A um, couple of technical things for today's um, uh, lecture. I switched over to a mic uh, to use. Uh, the sound quality was a little so-so in the last few lectures. I apologize for that. We're gonna see if this works a little bit better for you all. And so uh, I've switched over to a mic and we'll see how that works. Um, hopefully it will give you a little bit better sound quality. So what I'm gonna do, go ahead and share our screen and we will get a roll in with the lecture for today. So like I said, welcome back to Case Management 535. I am particularly excited for this lesson. Anytime I have an opportunity to discuss wraparound with y'all, um, I look forward to it. And, uh, and wraparound has profoundly changed um, the way that I prepare my case management, that I engage in discussions with my clients. And so it is an opportunity uh, today that I'm excited for to be able to share some of these useful tips that I've encountered throughout my uh, career in the past 15 years of providing wrap with you all. All right. So um, if you don't have your cup of coffee, go ahead and grab something or some tea. Make yourselves comfortable and we'll go ahead and dive into this lesson. Structure for today will be the same with our opportunities to discuss now the planning phase in the gym model, which actually is referred to as the same in the wraparound model. We call that planning. Okay. And that, that comes after implementation. All right. So here's what we want to do. The plan of care. Let's talk plan of care. In case management, as a social worker, after you are done completing your assessment, or sometimes another social worker will complete the assessment and hands off the case to you, what you're going to be doing is preparing a case plan. The case plan is a specific list of needs and strategies that you have identified, ideally under the wraparound model with your client that you are assigned to work with, okay? Um, that maps out the plan for success, okay? Where you want the final destination for your client to be and how you're gonna get them there along the treatment process. In a clinical sense, we refer to that as a clinical treatment plan, okay? That's something different from the case plan. The clinical treatment plan has to be tied to specific goals that are billable under Medi-Cal, they utilize specific numbers and codes for all of that, and it's tied to a diagnosis. Okay, that's a little bit different than what I'm referring to to a case plan. A case plan encompasses everything. It will encompass treatment, it will encompass other resources that may be clinical, some may not be clinical, but includes everything, a comprehensive list of everything that the client needs in order to be successful in reaching their goals, including their clinical goals. So it's important to understand that some of our clients are gonna to come to us Seeking services from a clinician or a therapist, only one of the things that they're going to need, right? They may need additional things that fall out of the clinical realm, housing, um, food, right? Um, safety, security, a job, whatever the case is. So your case plan is going to cover all of that, okay? In wraparound, we refer to the case plan as the plan of care or POC, okay? Now in today's lecture, I'm going to give you specific examples from a real provider of what the plan, the plan of care template looks like so that when you step out into your future career, you are not only learning the ideology and the process of wraparound in a figurative sense, you have the opportunity to literally look at and work with some of the templates that providers are using now in the field, all right, that that's going to give you the advantage above other applicants that are out there, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I wanna give you an overview of what a plan of care is so you understand that a little bit better. You'll hear me refer to the plan of care or the case plan synonymously, so please know that I'm just addressing, using those two terms to address the same thing. So a plan of care serves as the roadmap for a client or family. Some of you have heard me use this, this analogy before, but imagine if your plan of care, all right, is a trip to a vacation destination. Close your eyes for a second and picture 
the vacation destination that you want to go to more than anywhere else. Maybe it's something on your bucket list. Maybe it's not on your bucket list, but it's something you have been wanting to do for a long period of time. I am going to share with you, for me personally, ever since I was a little kid, I had this burning desire to go to Disney World. For me, I was fascinated with Disney World. I wanted to go to Disney World more than anything else. I begged my parents, could they take me to Disney World? And no, no, they did not. So primarily for financial reasons, right? So Disney World was not in our budget growing up and that was something that was a bit of a, a pipe dream for me. So when I became old enough, I uh, had my own family, I, I, I asked my wife, I said, look, Disney World's been on my list. This is something that I wanna do. Could we please do this together? And she was all for it. And so last year, we had the, two years ago, we had the opportunity to go to Disney World for the first time. But it was a two year process of literally saving to go to Disney World, okay? So think of, think of for the sake of this analogy, our, our plan of care today would be my trip to Disney World. My end destination is my vacation spot. It's Disney World, that's where I wanna end up, okay? So I wanna make it from my home in Colton, California, and I wanna end in Disney World, that's my journey. Now along the way, there need to be a series of steps in place. I have some needs that I need to accomplish in order to make it to my final destination. Things like planning the dates of the trip, things like budgeting for how much it's gonna cost, things like finding a place to stay, things like calculating the plane costs, right? Things like purchasing additional clothes or supplies or luggage that you need to make that trip. Things like planning for a dog sitter, who's gonna watch my hounds while I'm gone. All of these steps are strategies and needs along the way that need to happen for me and my family to be able to make it to our intended vacation spot of Disney World. So your case plan essentially is the same thing. What you're doing in the assessment phase and in the first phase of engagement is you're asking your clients, where do you wanna go? In the time that we are working together, I have some needs maybe on behalf of my agency or the court. You have some needs on behalf of your family or your client or your relationships or your life. Let's put those together into a case plan. Let's determine where we wanna be at the end of this process and let's make some steps along the way that are gonna get us there. That is the plan of care. So it serves as, if you will, this analogy, a roadmap for the client and the family, okay? Your strategies are the stops that you make, that path along the way, right? You gotta stop and get gas, you're gonna have to stop and refill at some point. You are gonna have to stop and reassess your map and see if it's still where you wanna go. And at that time, your case plan is going to lay out the specific strategies that need to happen in order for you to end at that, that destination. It's important to understand in the wraparound context that the plan of care is considered, and this is a terminology we use in, in wraparound, it's considered a living document, a living document. Now what that means is, as a social worker, when you establish a plan of care with your family, you're not setting the plan and then simply saying, well, you know what, we're gonna follow up in 90 days and we're gonna see how this goes and good luck to you and I'll call you once a week and check in and we'll see where we are in 90 days. No, in wraparound, the plan of care is what we refer to as a living document, which means that we, we, we meet weekly with our clients and with our family and we're gathering updates from the team on how the strategies are going. What is the progress we're making to making it to that, that Disney World trip, okay? Are we on track? Did we have unexpected expenses that set back our budget? Did the flights that we want uh, and originally scheduled, were they canceled? Was the hotel overbooked for that trip? Whatever the case is, right? And so you're assessing in real time how things are going. And here's the beauty about wraparound that I truly appreciate. You don't sort of set it and forget it, right? You don't set it and walk away. What you do is you set a goal, weekly you follow up. And if you're not seeing the progress as a team, with the client included, that you want to achieve that destination, guess what? You redo the plan or you tinker with that one section, you adjust those needs or strategies. And that's what I love about RAP, is everything's done in real time with real feedback. So we consider the case plan, the plan of care, a living document, okay? And finally, the plan of care is gonna serve as your compass during your journey. So picture that when you're working with one particular client or family, that's only one of many. You're gonna have sometimes in a wraparound setting, 12, 13, maybe up to 14 families that you're working with, that's a little high, but you'll have maybe up to that much. As a social worker in other settings, you can work, be working with many more clients. As a counselor, okay, first I literally had 
what, four or 500 kids on my caseload, students, okay? So what's important to understand is your case plan and the more accurate it is, the better it's going to help you gauge your progress with your client. And you'll wanna understand the progress better if referring to your case plan. So that's gonna provide direction for you and your client to refer to in this process, especially considering you'll be working with many clients simultaneously during your time as a social worker. All right, so in the wraparound plan of care, we divide the plan of care, oh, I'm sorry about that sneak peek. The wraparound plan of care is divided. And when we plan and we provide strategies in the plan of care, we do this in 14 what we call life domains. These life domains serve as categories for where we can place need statements and strategies. Now, some of you may be asking the question, what is a need statement? What is a strategy? Please don't worry about that, okay? I'm gonna actually cover that in subsequent slides. So for now, what you just wanna know is that there are 14 different uh, uh, categories that you can use to plan and apply your case plan with the clients you're serving. Many of you are hoping to remember that one of the things that we asked for in a solid case plan and a solid assessment, any documentation that you are doing with your clients or your families that you're serving, it needs to be what we refer to in our field as highly individualized, highly individualized. And what that means is we don't take a cookie cutter approach when working with a family. It's not a one size fits all. And so in wraparound, what we do is we discuss the needs. What are some of the things that family needs to accomplish their goal in the time they're working with us? And then what we do is we put those need statements under these categories wherever they work best for the family. Now, let me, let me back, uh, back up for a second and, and, and say that again. We place the need statements in these categories, in these life domains, based on what works for the family. So let me just give you a quick example Sometimes families will come to us and they'll say they need a bigger place to live. They're living maybe a family of four in a two bedroom apartment and they're trying to figure out where everyone's gonna be during the day and where everyone's gonna sleep and all of these kind of things. And so initially a mom may come to me and say, I, I need a bigger place. I need to find a bigger place to live that's within my budget. And so it may be our inclination as a social worker to say, well, mom needs a bigger place. That's all it is. Now in the planning process, when we, we start drilling down to what a need statement is in the strategy, we're gonna apply what we call the why test when developing a need statement. And don't worry, I'm gonna make all this abundantly clear in a second. But in the course of getting to talk with mom, one of the things I may discover is yes, there's a practical reason why mom may want a bigger place to live, just so she has a bedroom, let's say, for uh, one or two kids to share, okay? But maybe I also realize in the course of this, what mom's really talking about here, she wants a, big, a bigger place for her kiddos to live, but she feels extremely inadequate and is a failure to her kids as a provider because she doesn't have the income to support a larger place to live. And so what mom's really telling me is, I want the larger place to live, but I also feel awful about the fact that I can't provide for my children. Well, now I may not choose to have that bigger apartment or renting a home or buying a home under a place to live. I may actually move it under category number two, life domain number two under emotional. Because if we were to meet that need in talking to mom and say, if we were able to have, to get you to a place where you can afford either a larger apartment or you can rent or purchase a home, what would that do for you and for your family? And if mom tells me, you know what, I would feel just like, like a better mom. I would feel like a better provider. I wouldn't feel so down on myself and so negative about my ability to provide for my children. Well, you know what? To me, that sounds like a little bit more of an emotional category, an emotional life to me. And so when planning, I might ask mom, would you prefer then? I'm hearing that, that a bigger place to live is going to provide some logistical benefits for you and your family. But I'm also hearing it's going to just solidify your role as a mother. So do we want to really place this, this, this living situation, the larger place to live under emotional? And if mom feels that, yes, this is what I need, now you've created buy-in for mom. So opposed to telling our clients where their needs fit in these categories, these life domains, what we do is we ask them where they fit. And this creates buy-in. Imagine asking someone asking you, rather than when you're saying, well, I need a car, right? And someone comes to you and says, oh, you know what? I got your car. I picked it for you. Uh, here's your new vehicle. You're welcome, right? It's nice. Okay, you got a new car. That's exciting. But at the same time, you didn't have any say in the process. You didn't get to shop for it. And you maybe didn't get to pick your favorite color or maybe your favorite model or whatever the case is, right? And so you feel like you've been given this opportunity, this help, um, but you feel a little distant from the process. 
This is the same thing. Part of what we need to do in a case plan is create buy-in with our client and our family, and this is an effective way of doing that, okay? If you notice here, I just wanna point out in wraparound, and this is before um, the state started to ramp up some of its discussions around planning around spiritual and faith uh, components with clients. You see number eight here in our life domain is spiritual. So some families may choose to place some of their need statements under the life domain of spiritual. So we'll go ahead and move on. Let me show you an example. This is an example, let me move my face out of the way here, of a plan of care. This is a real plan of care template. This is something I wanna share for you. The name of the agency has been blacked out um, for the family's, uh, sorry, the agency's protection. No, I'm just kidding, but this is a real plan of care update, okay? This is something that if you are a social worker and step into the field as a facilitator doing wraparound, you will actually be building off of this template. This is your care plan, your case plan, what we refer to as the child and family team meeting plan of care, okay? I wanted to show you this because I can pretty much guarantee that in most MSW programs, they will never have seen an actual template for the plan of care in a California wraparound context. I can pretty much guarantee that no one has seen this template because this is specific to Riverside County and the provider in which is providing wraparound. So you are at an advantage in this course because you have an active knowledge of what it takes to provide wraparound. So please, let's draw in on this. If you notice in wraparound in the top left-hand corner of the plan of care, you'll see phases, right? Engagement and planning. What they did was they combined the first two phases together. Engagement and planning, implementation and transition. If you notice, doesn't that look similar to the GEM model, right? This is why I'm including wraparound in this particular course for you. It'll have information, general information like most case plans will, about the child, their address, the facilitator, who's, who's a social worker involved, right? When the, 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 the youth or the family was referred and what setting they are currently living in, right? Such as home, foster home, group home or residential care, hospitalized, maybe it's a psychiatric hold, or they are at a juvenile detention facility, right? So it's important to, to understand that. Now, um, sorry, I don't, didn't know what was happening here. Here at the bottom, you'll have a mission statement. Now that's something that we won't spend a lot of time discussing currently because that's relatively minor um, in terms of the, the large case planning uh, process. But what we will do want to draw your attention to is these categories here. So you can see on the template, we see needs right here, strengths, strategies, the person responsible, the due date or the time frame for the completion of that strategy the cost, the budget, or the resources it's gonna take in order to achieve that strategy. And then um, later, as you move through the process into implementation in the gym model or the wraparound model, prior uh, uh, plan of care outcomes or updates. This is what I mean by a living document. This document is intended to be reviewed weekly, not only by the professionals on the team, but also by the client and the family that we are serving. And if you notice, here are the life domains. There they are. So number one, two, three, you've got your family, your safety, legal, we always start with safety, okay? Emotional, behavioral, school and educational. Really quick, we'll flip the page on our template and you can see they continue on all the way down the list, okay? Now, at the end, this is the third page here, then you've got all your good stuff. You've got your signatures, your contact numbers, all that essential information. You don't need to focus a lot on that. Here's what I want you to focus on. There are needs and strengths, okay? These are the foundations. Remember when I said wraparound is a needs-driven, strength-based process. So the most time in a plan of care, when a social worker is building that plan of care, they're gonna spend the most time developing the need statements and, the, and basing them off the strengths that you identified early on in the wraparound process when meeting with the family during that first family meeting, okay? So that's why these strengths come back into play because we depend on the strengths listed for each of these, under each of these life domains, these strategies here, all right, to address the needs, okay? So a couple of light things to also remember just about the case planning process. In social work, just a reminder, like I said, families, children, clients don't come to us because everything is perfect in their lives. In fact, it's probably the opposite, right? And so many times it's important to understand that safety is an important factor to consider in any population that we are serving as a social worker. In a wraparound context, under a plan of care, under best practices, you will always 
always have something listed under safety. So remember when I, I stated that we're gonna give families an opportunity, right? To say, I feel like a need for me fits better under family or legal, or it fits better for me under social relationships or fun and recreational, right? However, when it comes to safety, we always address safety. And remember my analogy of using safety similar to an earthquake plan, right? We're gonna plan for safety measures, even though they may never happen and we truly hope they don't, but we're gonna plan around them regardless. Well, safety will always be listed on every plan of care. There will never be a plan of care under a quality wrap plan of care development that is absent of a safety component, okay? Now, after that, you are free to fit the needs of the family into one of these categories based on the family's input, okay? So now let's drill down for today's lecture. All we're gonna do is focus on needs and strategies. These are the only two things that we're gonna look at. All of this stuff you can learn and plan around later. You're gonna receive other training and documentation in this course that will address um, how to assign time frames. We'll talk a little bit about that too, you know, and all of these other things in follow-up. But what's important to understand is a good social worker, regardless of working on RAP or not, you're gonna to wanna to be able to drill down to the difference between a need and a strategy. So let's talk about that because these are imperative. These drive that process of making it right to the vacation destination at the end of the family's journey. So let's move forward out of this. Let's talk about needs versus strategies. I'd like to focus our attention on needs first. So like I said, on the plan of care, you're gonna develop needs. We refer to those as needs statements, needs statements in wraparound. A needs statement needs to be broad and enduring, broad and enduring. So a good needs statement that we're developing with a family, I'm gonna give you real examples of these, all right, is broad and enduring, meaning it's going to encompass a number of things. It doesn't address only one thing, okay? and it's going to take time to accomplish. So that is opposite of a strategy. I'll present strategies in a second. So needs need to be broad and enduring. They need to take time to accomplish and they require multiple strategies to address them. So a need dives deeper into what's happening with your client or your family. A need is addressing the complexity of the client or the family situation, okay? Now when we look at strategies, strategies are equally important but they serve a different function. Strategies are services provided to meet the need, okay, of your client or your family. You see that? So strategies, all right, are gonna work to accomplish the deeper need of the child or the family that you're serving. Strategies usually have an end date, okay? So whether that is a series of tutoring classes that last six weeks, well, at the end of the six weeks, the tutoring has been delivered, we see if the grade goes up. Um, another strategy could be a food bank. Right? A food bank is a strategy because you know that you have to visit the food bank on a specific date. Once you visit that food bank, you've got your food and life continues on, right? Housing assistance. You go to section eight, you file out paperwork, and once that appointment is done, you wait for the next step. These are all strategies because they are specific and they have an end date in mind, all right? They're usually unique to each family and client. So a strategy you wanna make really tired uh, tied to a client. You wouldn't give cl every client a food bank if not all of your clients are starving, right? You wouldn't say that every family needs a Section 8, eight housing uh, application if families live in a home that's already settled or they have no need for housing. You wouldn't assign every family, um, let's say, parenting classes when some are parenting just fine. You wouldn't assign every single family substance dependency classes when some of the families you work with aren't addicted to substances. And so the point with this is, is any strategy that you're developing needs to be uh, connected to the family. It needs to be adequate for what the family is going through. There's no one size fits all, okay? Uh, and then of course, strategies are one way of addressing the need, but not necessarily the only way. So let me give you an example of that. We have to make sure that when we're developing strategies, we're not develop developing them with a mindset of what we think the family needs. And let me give you an example. I worked with a dad, uh, many years ago, big burly guy, long, long, super beard, really cool, all tatted up, but super, super nice, welcoming, uh, uh, down to earth guy, worked construction. And dad had a lot of anger issues and he was also a recovering alcoholic. Dad maintained his sobriety. He was firm on that. He didn't want to go back to drinking, but dad still had some anger issues. Dad had a short fuse, and when the kids stressed him out, he tended to yell a lot. So he never hit the kids, but he would yell, and that would create a, a strain on the kids' relationships, and obviously with his wife, things were not going well because she was tired of him yelling all the time. 
previous social workers came back and said uh, to dad, and he was, he was tired of hearing this, was you need to go to anger management and you need to go to therapy and you need to also maybe consider psychiatric help. Maybe you need some medication to calm you down or things like this. Dad was not big on therapy. Dad had experienced previous trauma in his life. He was tired of opening up to a therapist over and over. By the time I got to him, we were talking about anger and he was you know, very blunt with me and said, if you're going to tell me to go see a therapist, you can go beep, beep, beep yourself. So right away I knew, okay, we're not going to be pushing the therapy with this particular dad. And I said, okay, you know, first off, thank you for letting me know that. Second, can you tell me a little bit about your, your previous experience? Why maybe you're so um, guarded when it comes to therapy? Why is this not going to be a good fit for you is what I said. And so he told me the story of what was happening. And I said, well, what else is it that kind of helps clear your mind so that when life stressors come up, you don't result to yelling? Is there anything else that works for you? Dad says, you know what I like to do? You know what clears my head? You know what calms me down? I said, what? He says, I ride my Harley. Dad had a beautiful Harley in his garage that he had built. He had had with him over the years. Dad says, that Harley is the best therapy that I need for me. Every now and then I need to jump out on my Harley, take a two hour drive to clear my mind. And when I come back, I'm good. And he says, and you know what? It would spend less time and less money on therapy. I joked with him. I told him, well, look, I'm a car guy. And so I kind of doubt that it's going to cost less money than therapy because I know how much it costs to restore a car. But I told him, I do understand the therapeutic um, uh, process behind clearing your mind with a drive, right? So I said, so let's try this. He said, when was the last time you rode? He says, I haven't been able to ride in six months. Things have been too busy in the home. And I said, well, I said, so we're with his wife. We're, you know, we're all together as a family in this meeting. I said, if you were to go to therapy you know, and travel to a clinic, you're going to be gone for a two-hour round trip anyway. Let's say it took half an hour to get there, half an hour back. There's an hour, and you have about 45, 50 minutes of therapy. There's your two hours. I said, family, could we maybe consider this? Dad's saying that if he, were, if he rode his Harley two hours a week, just like he would with therapy be gone for two hours a week, that he can come back, his mind would be cleared, and he wouldn't feel as inclined to be as grumpy, irritable, or yell at anyone. Could we give dad his space for two hours of therapy, but dad's therapy would look more like riding his Harley instead of showing up to a clinic? Do you see what we did was we developed a strategy that was tailored to the family's need, right? This dad was not not a fan of therapy. And I could have spent six months trying to convince him to go, or we could have gone with his plan and seen how it worked. In this case, it worked for dad. Simple two hour drive, a ride on his, on his motorcycle, being able to go out and come back. Dad felt fulfilled, dad felt calm. The relationship, the conflict in the home, the relationship was improving and the conflict in the home was decreasing. And we saw a change in dad's behavior. What dad needed was an opportunity to go out and take care of himself. That was the need statement. Dad needs opportunities to clear his mind and be the best possible father he can be. The strategy was riding the bike. Does that make sense? I hope that does. Okay, we're gonna do, dive deeper into this. So we're gonna talk about how do you then identify need statements? How do you distinguish between strategies? How do you put all this together? Early on in wraparound, I would ask families, what do you need? What do you need to be successful? And families would say, well, you know what? I need a home, I need a, I need a PlayStation 4, I need rent, I need this, I need that. And I had to be able to dissect what does this mean in terms of a need statement and then what is a strategy. I had to be able to determine between the both. Well, when they tell me, they give me this list of what they need, I have to determine what is a need and what is a strategy. So how do you do that? Let me give you some tips from what I've been doing for the past 15 years so you don't have to struggle like the early days of me as a case manager doing this myself, okay? Need statements need to pass the why test. In the social worker, sometimes in that first meeting with the family, when you're asking about needs, you're asking literally the why test. Now, to preface for the family, I try not to make this awkward, right? So I'm going to let them know. I'm going to give them a heads up. I'm saying, so I'm going to ask you, after we've set our goal, where do we want to be in the time that we're done working together? What do you want to have accomplished? And they'll tell me their dream, right? Where they want to be. So I'll turn that into a mission statement. And then what's going to happen is I say, so now what do you need, right? Let's talk about needs. What do you need to accomplish this goal? And then I give the family a heads up. I said, I'm going to be asking a lot of whys that sometimes seem really obvious, okay? I said, please don't take that as me being odd or confrontational or questioning. I said, what we're really going to do is an exercise here to drill down to distinguish between needs and strategies. I said, so, so I'm going to ask a series of whys, and then all I just need you to do is kind of respond to those, and we'll filter this out together. And I said, okay. So um, I'll ask a question 
I'll say, so what do you all need? Like for mom, she, I've had moms, plenty of moms and dads tell me, I want to be out of the system, right? I, I, that's what I want. I want to be out of the system. I want my case to close and I want social services to stop hounding me. That's what I want for my family. So I'll say, okay, if that's one of the wants, what do you need in order to have that happen? What do you need to do for your case plan to close? And then sometimes I'll hear someone say in the family, mom needs to quit drinking. Okay. I've heard that plenty of times. Mom needs to quit drinking. Uh, and by the way, I'm using mom here not to pick on moms, but most of the families that I've worked with in foster care for extended periods of time have been single mothers. I have worked with dads who have been in the picture or sometimes even single dads, but the vast majority of individuals that I've worked with in the foster care system have been single moms. And so sometimes um, you'll hear me refer to mom first as a strategy, and that's just coming from a, a place of experience, okay? So anyway, so some, someone may say mom needs to quit drinking. And I'll say, why does mom need to quit drinking? People will kind of look at me for a second. They're like, because her kids can be taken away. I said, I get it. I get that. However, mom doesn't need to quit drinking if she's willing to deal with the consequences of it, right? I mean, no one has to stop doing anything. It's their choice if they're going to live with the consequences. If mom is willing to live with the consequences of her children perhaps being taken away again, then she can continue drinking all she wants. If she's willing to deal with the consequences of her health declining, she can drink all she wants. So the question is, why does mom need to quit drinking? And so then the family may say, a family member say, because mom wants to be with her kids. They say, okay, why does mom want to be with her kids? Because she loves her kids. Ah, okay. And if we, if we quit drinking, what is that going to establish for loving her kids? They say, well, she's going to be the best mom that she can be. She can actually be there to love and care for her kids. Ah, so in, in doing the why test, one of the things that I've discovered then is mom loves her kids and wants to be the best mom that she can be for them. So my need statement would be, mom needs to be the best possible mother to her children as possible. The strategy becomes mom will, uh, will establish a sponsor, mom will join a 12 step program if that's what mom's prepared to do, or mom will enter treatment or mom will begin to address her sobriety so she can be the best possible mom she needs to be. Now, there's a number of other strategies that can fit under that need statement, right? Maybe mom wants to spend more quality time with her kids. Maybe mom wants to take, take her kiddos to the movies or the park once a week. These are strategies that fall under that need, but you see how I drilled down using the why test. I'll give you other examples later. Need statements need to be broad and enduring. I've said that before. Need statements should be clearly defined with timeframes assigned. Strategies, sorry, should be clearly defined with timeframes assigned. If you can assign it and have a due date and, and dictate who does it, chances are that's going to fall under a strategy as opposed to a need. We'll make that distinction possible or um, um, clear for you in a second. And follow-up is key. You want to be able to follow up on the progress of all of this in your plan. So. Um, we're gonna go through an exercise here. I know I've given you a lot of abstract. So some of you are still sitting there at your screens and you're thinking, Dr. Mexico, you lost me. I don't understand what's going on, huh? Some of you are saying, dude, wait a minute, what? Right? And some of you are saying, Dr. Mexico, I don't get it. You're raising your hand virtually. And you're saying, that all sounds nice, but you're talking about needs and strategies and life domains. And I'm a first year MSW student. I don't understand what you're saying. Relax, here's okay, that's okay first off. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a film clip and then we're gonna break this down together between need and strategy. Don't worry, okay? So, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the film The Breakup. The Breakup was a movie that was done a few years ago with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn as the main characters in there, right? And they break up, they were a couple and they break up. And we're gonna watch a scene from that movie and in the scene from that movie, they have a fight, okay? They have this, this verbal altercation. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch the film and then we're going to have a discussion about what were needs and what were strategies in the course of this scene. Okay. So let's sit back. Let's watch this scene from the breakup and then we will come back. No problem. If you're done a little bit later, I'm just going to the streets here for a little bit. Gary, come on. I don't want to do them later. Let's just do them now. Take 15 minutes. Oh, I, I am so exhausted. I just honestly want to relax for a little bit. If I could just sit here, let my food digest, and just try to enjoy the quiet for a little bit. Get some. Get some. Get some. That's what happens. And we will. Oh, 
would you clean the dishes tomorrow? You're, you know, I don't like waking up to a dirty kitchen. Who cares? I care, all right? I care. I busted my ass all day cleaning this house and then cooking that meal, and I worked today. It would be nice if you said thank you and helped me with the dishes. Fine. I'll help you do the damn dishes. Oh, come on. You know what? No, that's, see, that's not what I want. You just said that you want me to help you do the dishes. I want you to want to do the dishes. Why would I want to do dishes? Why? See, that's my whole point. Let me see if I'm following this. Okay. Are you still telling me that you're upset because I don't have a strong desire to clean dishes? No, I'm upset because you don't have a strong desire to offer to do the dishes. I just did. After I asked you. Jesus, Brooke, you're acting crazy. Don't you, know? you call me crazy. I am not crazy. I didn't call you crazy. Just I didn't did. call you crazy. No, I didn't. I said you're acting crazy. You know what, Gary? I asked you to do one thing today, one very simple thing, to bring me 12 lemons, and you brought me three. Damn it, if I knew that it was going to be this much trouble, I would have brought home 24 lemons. Even a hundred lemons. I know what I wish. I wish everyone that was at that goddamn table had their own little private bag of lemons. You're I'm not about the lemons. Well, that's all you're talking about. I'm just saying it, it'd be nice if you did things that I asked. It would be even nicer if you did things without me having to ask you. Well, I do seem to remember doing something for you this morning without you asking. Gary, come on. <laughs> I'm you know serious. what? No, I'm, I'm serious. serious. I'm I serious. really am. Come on. You knew I was working today and I made that meal and. You could have thought to yourself, you know, you could have said, yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to get Brooke some flowers. You said on our very first date that you don't like flowers, that they're a waste of money. Every girl likes flowers, Gary. You say that you don't like flowers. I'm supposed to take that to mean that you do like flowers? No, this is not about, you're not, you're not, you're, you're, that you're not getting it. You're not getting this, Gary. Okay, it's not about the lemons. It's not about the flowers. It's not about the dishes. It's just, um, how many times do I have to drop hints about the ballet? You know I can't. Brooke, come here. We talked about the damn ballet. I hate the goddamn ballet. You got a bunch of dudes in tights flopping around for three hours like a medieval techno show. It's a nightmare. I sit there and sweat. The whole thing. I do. I'm wondering when the hell's the goddamn nightmare going to end. Go to a damn ballet. It's not about you loving the ballet, Gary. It's about the person that you love loves the ballet, and you want to spend time with that person. Not when they're at the ballet. Okay, forget the ballet. I forget the ballet. We don't go anywhere together. We just went to Ann Arbor together. To Ann Arbor? To the Michigan Notre Dame game. You, th you think screaming drunk kids and leprechauns doing backflips, that's fun. That's fun for me. Come on, man. I did that for you. What do you how do you show up for me? I'm up on the bus every goddamn day. Come for you. on. You I'm busting my ass to be the best tour guy in the damn city so I can make enough money to support both of us, and hopefully you won't have to work one day. I want to work. All I ask, Brooke, is that you show a little bit of appreciation. But I just get 20 minutes to relax when I come home instead of being attacked with questions and nag the whole damn thing. You think that I nag you? That's all you do. All you do is nag me. The bathroom's a mess. Your belt doesn't match. Hey, Gary, you should probably go work out. Nothing I ever do is ever good enough. I just want to be left the hell alone. Really? Is that what you want, Gary? Is that what you want? Yeah. That's what you want? Yeah. Fine. Great. Do whatever the hell you want. You leave your socks all over this house, dress like a pig, play your stupid ass video game. I don't care. I'm done. What? I am done. I don't deserve this. I really do not deserve this. I deserve somebody who gives a shit. I'm not spending one more second of this life with some inconsiderate prick. You're a prick. Okay. So some of you are saying, wow, that's uh, quite an argument there. And I know other users are saying, uh, that reminds me of my relationship last week or something like that, right? So many of us have understood and have been in, when you've been in relationships, you've had conversations similar to this with your partner in which two people are attempting to share a perspective and what they're hearing and seeing in the relationship. And they're sort of passing, crossing paths, right? They're not, they're not landing in the same place. So in this particular film clip, there was a discussion about needs and strategies, okay? And I actually wanna draw in on that to help kind of solidify this discussion that we've been having. So let's analyze this film clip really quick and let's talk about what needs were going on. So Jennifer Aniston's character in this, this movie was talking about needs and she was talking about specifically what she needed in the relationship to feel like her partner, Vince Vaughn, was supporting her and hearing her in the relationship. 
Some possible need statements for this conversation could have been for Jennifer to feel as though she and her partner, she, um, as though her partner, I'm sorry, loves her and respects her interests, right? Another need could have been Jennifer needs for Vince to reciprocate the sacrifices she makes for him. So if you notice, Jennifer was talking about these, these incidents in where she supported Vince in his interests and that it didn't feel reciprocated because everything that Vince Vaughn wanted to do was of his interest, not of hers, right? And so she didn't ever feel like that things were being reciprocated in this relationship. Jennifer needs Vince to respect her career goals, right? So Vince Vaughn made an assumption that one day I want to make enough money so you don't have to work but he wasn't considerate of the fact that Jennifer said, I want to work. This is something I want to do. You are placing that need upon me. Jennifer needs Vince to listen and to support her, okay? And so there were strategies along the way, and this is where Vince Vaughn was being confused in his head because he thought that he was meeting the needs of Jennifer, but he was missing the boat, right? And so Jennifer was saying the strategies, right? The way that you can demonstrate to me that you are listening to me rather than just hearing me, but you are truly listening would have been these little things that you could have done along the way, right? Bring me the correct number of lemons, right? If you had brought me the correct number of lemons, I would have known that not only did you hear me, but you listened to me. You understood why I was asking for them. You were present in the moment. And if you're present in the moment, then that means that I'm on your mind and I'm feeling loved and respected, okay? If you're attending to entertainment activities, attending entertainment activities that she enjoyed, then Jennifer would have said, now I feel like you are sacrificing something, not because you love the ballet, but because you love me. And if you love me for who I am, you will take time to go to an event that I love and support because I do the same for you. This is reciprocation. This is love and sacrifice, right? So demonstrate that love for me by making a sacrifice, right? Putting her interests first, such as doing things as washing dishes from time to time. So Jennifer knows and appreciates the fact that he's working hard on the bus all day, as he said, right? But another piece to this would be is for every now and then for Vince Vaughn to be able to say, look, I understand too that you have a need and this makes you feel better. So I'm going to put aside a little bit of time here. I'm going to, I'm going to meet your need of washing the dishes and maybe afterwards I can go back to, to checking out and playing my video games, right? But this would have been a specific strategy that Vince could have done to demonstrate his willingness to put Jennifer first. And if he put Jennifer first, then she would have felt like she was first in that relationship, okay? And that would have avoided the conflict. So I hope this, this makes more sense. Do you see how these are broad and enduring? These aren't specific. These can't be accomplished by just doing one thing. On this side here, on the strategies, they are specific. They were time oriented, right? She asked for lemons on a specific time. He was to bring them back that evening. If he had done this, he would have helped fulfill one of these needs. If he had attended a series of events that Jennifer was interested in, he would have met some of these needs. If he had put her interest first through little things around the housework, it would have met one of these needs. So here's the difference between a need and a strategy. So here's what I'd like to do. Um, what I would like to do now is let's break down a list and let's look at what are needs and what are strategies? And let's see what we think, okay? So I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? A PlayStation 4, and these are all things I've literally heard from families when I ask, what do we need? So these come from children, these come from, from parents, things like that. Most kids will say, I need a PlayStation 4. So I'll ask the question to a, a kiddo, why do you need a PlayStation 4? And they'll say, well, it helps me calm down. It's a strategy. I say, you've been in therapy a while, right? If you're like, I'm using it as a positive coping to decrease my anger outburst. And I'm like, wow, you've been going to therapy a minute, right? So I'll say, so tell me more about that. They say, well, PlayStation allows me to separate from my family in a home, okay? And it gives me time to not fight with my brothers and sisters. And I say, okay, so you feel like PlayStation 4 is a need? And they'll say, yes. And I say, so let's talk about this. There's going to be one day in your life down the road, maybe it's a boss, maybe it's a colleague, a coworker, whatever the case is, you're out at a restaurant, someone's going to say something that upsets you. Are you going to have a PlayStation 4 available at your side that you can stop and you can walk away with? And the kid will say, well, no, I won't have a PlayStation 4 then. I said, so what else can you do? And I said, well, I can do heavy breathing exercises or I can choose not to engage with anger. I can do this or that and say, okay, so PlayStation 4 is maybe falling under the category of strategy. It's one way of meeting a need. What is the ultimate need? What is it we're trying to do in working with you on your anger? So after a series of conversations, what we would draw a child to is to say, 
look, the need is we want you to be able to express your feelings in a way that doesn't hurt others. Okay. A strategy could be a PlayStation 4, but a strategy could also be breathing exercises, artwork, yelling into your pillow, taking up kickboxing or a punching bag. There's a number of other things, strategies you can do to fulfill that need. So I would place a PlayStation 4 under the strategies list. A larger place to live. We've already covered this before, right? Now, in some cases, as a social worker, you may have a legal definition of what is an inappropriate size of space for X number of people to live in. So if that's the case, what you may have to distinguish is if that's it and it's a legal issue, then it maybe becomes a need, okay? But maybe what it is is a larger place to live could be a strategy, all right? Because for that mom, it would have given her a more empowered sense of being a provider for her family. And so one way to show that would be being able to move her family into a home where everyone felt comfortable. So in that case, a larger place to live could actually be a strategy. It could even be a need, depending on how you look at it. The key point to understand with this is, is what it means for the family that you're serving. If this family is going to feel empowered and loved and capable, right, self-sufficient um, self to be able to provide a larger home, maybe it falls under, falls under the need category, but maybe it's a strategy, one thing that can demonstrate that and move that forward to the family. Parents need to leave me alone. My parents need to leave me alone. I'll hear this from kids all the time. What do you think, a need or a strategy? In many cases here, it's usually a strategy, right? Um, sometimes you'll see that, that episode where children are, are um, what we call um, triggered, okay? And they are in a cycle of where they are uh, escalated and they are engaging in conversations and argument with the parent. And so the child tries to leave, maybe they try to run to their room, they slam the door and what happens? The parent comes in right behind them and starts yelling at them and opens the door. Right? And that usually makes the situation worse. So in many ways, sometimes the parents leave me alone could actually be a strategy in a time where we can communicate with the parents. When your child and you are upset and you start to yell and your child goes to the room and closes the door, that actually may not be a bad thing. Because what we've avoided here is a conversation that's going to heighten, to escalate and get worse. Also, instead of running away or disappearing, and you don't know where your child is, they've gone to their room. So maybe a strategy here for a moment is not to maybe leave them alone, right? But the strategy is allow time for the child to de-escalate. This is the clinical terminology we use to de-escalate, to utilize some of their positive coping mechanisms, to be able to chill out for a second and come back to the conversation when everyone's more calm. So that could be a strategy, okay? Car repair, a need or a strategy. Now I've heard social workers say this is an absolute need. Living in Southern California, it may be a need. That may be the case, right? So if you're living in the desert in Indio and your job is in Cathedral City, Cat City, okay, you will definitely probably need a car uh, because public transportation is going to take hours to get to where you need to be. And in Southern California, a car may be in need. However, here's something to consider with car repair. If there is a, a way for public transportation to come together, if there is a carpool, if there is some other resource that's in place, maybe the need isn't for the car repair. Maybe the need at this point is for mom or dad to have the capacity to be able to financial stability, to be able to make repairs to their car when it is needed. Then one strategy to that may be increasing their income looking for other work, maybe going back to a trade school, improving their education, having the ability, the means to repair the car when an unexpected um, uh, whatever breaks on it, right? And so a car repair may end up being a strategy, but it could also be a need depending on the situation. To feel loved, right? When a client, when a mother, when a father, when a child tells me, I need to feel loved, what do you think? Need or strategy? 100% of the time, this is going to fall under need, right? And so every one of us needs to feel loved, needs to feel appreciated. So at the end of the day, this is important. A cleaner house, a need or a strategy. Sometimes I'll see social workers on literally both sides of the room hold up their hands when I say need. Some will say strategy. Here's important to understand. There are areas where cleanliness becomes a safety issue in a home, right? And so if there are issues where a child could hurt themselves, choke, burn, damage, puncture, whatever the case is, and things are so uncleanly in the home that it is a health hazard for those living in it, 
maybe a cleaner home becomes a need for the social worker. What's important to understand though, is that again, our cleanliness or our notion of what is clean cannot be imposed upon the family unless there is a legal uh, condition associated with that. So I've walked into many families' home where their uh, description of cleanliness or their interpretation of that is not the same as mine. In my home, if it was my house, I would consider that environment a dirty home. However, the cleanliness of the home for the client's home that I'm in isn't a safety concern. It hasn't reached that level. No one's in jeopardy of being hurt. It's just not necessarily organized to what I would organize my home to. And it's not necessary to the same level of cleanliness. Well, at that point, it's not for me to place that as a need for that family. Okay. But if there is a family whose safety is being threatened at that time, maybe it's a need for the social worker. And it's important to understand that, but still we have to have the family's buy-in. And so maybe sometimes that requires a hard discussion with the family to be able to say, look, I understand that your interpretation of what is clean or dirty is different from mine. However, I don't want to talk about that interpretation. What I want to be able to discuss with you is what the judge would see when I have to report the condition of the home. And so this need here is for us to be able to communicate with the judge, the need statement could be that you are providing a safe and stable, loving environment for your family. One strategy to that might be bringing the home up to code per the requirements of the law so that your home meets the conditions of being safe, stable, and loving for the children that we have placed, your children, in this home. And so the need becomes the ability to provide a safe and stable, loving home. The strategy becomes cleaning up the home so it meets that standard, okay? A child to attend school, a need or a strategy. What do you guys think? Need or strategy? Some people say it's a need. Some people say it's a strategy. So the state of California will say it's a need, right? If you miss school too much, you can face the SAR board and you could be um, held uh, liable as a parent, criminal prosecution, even uh, heavy fines, right? If a child doesn't go to school. Um, but what's the deeper need why a child needs to go to school? Well, they want to have opportunities down the road. They want to have a better job. They maybe want to go to college, whatever the case is. And so the child attending school doesn't necessarily become the need alone. That's the strategy. The child, if they were to attend school, if we were to ask why do they need to attend school, could be, well, so they can have, they can get into college. Well, why do they want to get into college? So that they become an engineer. Why do they want to become an engineer? Because they've been fascinated with that and they feel that they can provide for themselves if they were doing that. Why do they want to provide for themselves? Because maybe they want to have a family down the road and they want to be a good provider for their family. Ah, so maybe the child, the need statement is they need to have options down the road to be successful for their own family one day. One strategy to that will be attending school tomorrow in order to help make a, build, a better future for themselves down the road. So see how this, what appears to be a need could be fashioned into a strategy because it's tied to something broad and enduring, okay? For a parent to attend school, need or strategy? Well, for some parents, they may feel it's a need, right? They're trying to gain that same thing, that better future for their child, for their family. Um, and what it means is though, is that if they were able to do this, they would have opportunities to provide more for their child or family down the road. And so this would look more similar to that, a strategy right? So that that parent down the road could be the best possible parent they can be, or they can provide the resources, the time and the attention that their children need. And parent and attending school will provide them with career training to open the door for future success. Okay. A job, a need or a strategy. Again, this would fall under, it seems like a need, right? We need to have work. We need to pay bills. But why do we need to do that? Because there's people that live uh, without shelter, without housing every single day, and they survive their life is very difficult, it's very hard, but your head doesn't explode if you don't have a job, right? So why do we need to have a job? Well, we want to have a home over our head. We wanna have food in our pantries. We wanna be able to provide, we wanna have healthcare, we wanna have all of these things. If we wanna be the best possible version of ourselves, a job is one strategy that allows us to fulfill our purpose and also provide for those that we love. So a job could fall under a strategy. To meet court requirements, ooh, now this one. It gets controversial when I do this training for social workers who have been social workers with Riverside County or San Bernardino County for 15 years. I will ask this question, is a meeting the court requirements a need or a strategy? And this will actually get debate going back and forth between social workers. Many folks say that this is a need. 
this is a need. They'll say they need to obey the court's requirements. They need to meet these requirements. And I say, do they? Do they really? Let's think about this. In child welfare, what happens is when a child enters our system, they're done with an assessment, some social worker comes out, conducts a biopsychosocial and spiritual assessment, and then they build a case plan and they say, you are responsible for doing this case plan, right? And what happens? If they don't meet the court requirements, then the child can be placed back into care. The parent could be charged with uh, further additional maltreatment or abandonment you know, codes or things like this. Uh, there can be legal and financial consequences if they don't meet the requirements. But, but what else happens? We forget that many times children have entered our care because there's been generations of neglect of maltreatment going on for years. And families at this time have lived with those consequences. So does a family need to fulfill the court requirements? Not if they're willing to deal with the consequences of it. Some families, if they're willing to deal with the consequence of the child being removed, if they're willing to face the court consequences that their families have faced before them, then this is not a need to the family. It's a need for us as a social worker, because in our minds, we're saying, how could a family want this court process? How could a family want for children to be removed, neglected, uh, or, or taken from them? But we have to understand this is our need that we are placing upon the family. So what's important to understand here is that we have to be able to relay to the family why our needs become their needs when they're involved in our system. So sometimes what's important to understand is I've had to have many conversations with families because they've said, you know what, I don't need to go to parenting classes. I'm fine with the way I've parented. This is the way that my parents have parented. I don't need to go to substance um, classes or, or maintain my sobriety. My dad was a functioning alcoholic and, and you know, he did fine in his life. And I'll say, so here, here's the requirement. I need to ask you a question though. Do you want your family to be together? And many parents will say, well, of course I want my family to better be together. I want my child in placement. So I'll say, do you guys want social services out of your life? And they'll say, absolutely. We want our case to close. We want to be left alone. But in order for that to happen, the court's going to need to see a few things. Some of what the court is mandating for parenting classes and for you to maintain your sobriety are important for the court to see so that you can have your family together and you can move on with your lives. Until those things are demonstrated, okay, those things can't happen, those goals for you. So my job is to bring our needs together. I have some needs on behalf of the court that need to happen so that you can meet your needs. Can we commit to blending these together? I understand that no one's gonna make you maintain your sobriety and no one's gonna make you take those parenting classes, but can you commit to please accomplishing those goals because in fulfilling some of the needs of the court, you'll be able to meet your own needs as a family. And this is the conversation that I've had to have with some of my workers, uh, I'm sorry, with some of my families. And so to social workers, what I say is meeting court requirements, that's our need. That's not necessarily the families if they can live with those consequences. But the reality is sometimes both needs need to come together, right? We have to, we have to see each other's needs and work on those together in order to accomplish a larger goal. And that's what we're trying to get the family on board with. All right. Let me break this down really quick. So I'm gonna give you some examples of very practical sense now. These are need statements that are taken from actual plans of care, from actual wraparound facilitators that I've supervised over the years and we've tailored them, we've drilled them down to refined, refined need statements in order to make them the strongest possible need statements possible to address strategies or to build strategies to address them, okay? So here's a little bit more further tangible way of seeing need statements. Here's some samples that I've seen over the years. Charlie needs to go to school. Well, we've already talked about that, right? Here's another way to do it. Charlie needs to be a successful and responsible adult. This is another way of utilizing the language, all right, of, of uh, a need statement of being broad and enduring that fits better under the wraparound category. Let's look at another one. Johnny needs to be able to provide, I'm sorry, or Charlie needs to be able to provide for himself when he's on his own. So see, this is Encompassing Charlie may need to go to school. Yes, but that's one strategy to accomplish one of these goals and this I Apologize. It should have been Charlie. I don't know where Johnny came from my bad. I'm sorry about that Okay, so let's go back. So let's look at a couple more need statements really quickly Mom needs to test clean. You'll hear this all the time, right? You hear social workers say all the time mom needs to test clean. She needs to stop doing drugs True, but why mom needs to be the best possible uh, the best parent she can for her children Okay, one way of doing that is testing clean. Another way of doing that is spending time with her kids. Another way of doing that is telling her kids that she loves them. 
Another way of doing that is providing for them as a mother. So you see how there's multiple strategies that can meet this need. This is one strategy. Testing clean is a strategy to a deeper need. Okay. Um, here's another one. Charlie needs to know why his mom is healthy and can keep and that can keep him safe. So this is written from the child's perspective. So this need statement, if you think that mom needs to get it, if mom needs, we need to impersonate on the pressure and press upon mom the need to stay sober and if that's going to really drive the process then sometimes we can go from mom's perspective however i've also worked with situations where charlie from the child's perspective can can help mom understand how her inability to maintain her sobriety how her substance dependency is impacting her child okay so sometimes you can write the need statement from the child's perspective and say charlie needs to know his mom is healthy and can keep him safe when mom hears that, sometimes that is able to sort of jostle for her the need because it's impacting her child at that point. She doesn't want her child to feel unsafe or that she can't provide, okay? And so sometimes that works. And so it's however is gonna fit with the family, okay? We need a bigger place to live. I've heard this a lot, right? We need, and here's another way of saying it, we need to be a family that is loving and respectful of one another. In order to do that, we need a larger environment to live so that we're not arguing or on top of one another all the time. Okay, so you see how we can convert that. Here's another one. Mom needs a reliable income, right? So mom needs a job that's going to have a paycheck, let's say every week or every two weeks, right? Mom needs to be able to provide a loving home and stable environment for her uh, children, Charlie and Lawrence, okay? So in this way, what we're talking about here is mom needs a reliable income. Yes, but that's going to meet a deeper underlying need of being able to provide a loving uh, a home and stable living environment for her children, okay? so. Let's take a look at a couple more. Here's some good need statements, and then we can refine them down to better, okay? Here's one, Charlie needs to be supported coping with stress to help him not pull out her hair, or his hair, um, when he is overwhelmed. I'm sorry about that. Let's do this. Man. I apologize for that, you guys. I'm very sorry about that. And Charlie, here's another way of saying it. Charlie, uh, here's a different need statement, needs to be supported with resources to help him, um, to help stabilize his self-harm symptoms, right? Now, let's look at what could be a better way of saying each of these. A better way of saying this need statement here, Charlie needs to know he is loved and valued. That's it, right? He is loved and he is valued. And now what can happen with that is that he can have his coping mechanisms, his stress techniques, and all of these sort of things fall under that strategy. Here's another one. Charlie needs to feel safe and secure with his mother. That's it. And if he did that, he would be less inclined to engage in self-harm behavior. So when Charlie feels safe, he doesn't have the need to cut. When Charlie feels safe, he doesn't have the need to run away. When Charlie feels safe, he doesn't have the need to take substances, okay, to lean on substances in that process. And so what's important to understand is, is that these are broad, these are enduring, and these will require multiple strategies to meet that underlying need, okay? Last ones, here we go. We're wrapping it up. Here's a good need statement. This isn't bad, but like I said, over years of doing wraparound, here's how you can drill down a little better. Charlie needs to engage in positive and enjoyable activities and coping skills so that he does not rely on marijuana to feel better. Now this is solid. Some of you may say, isn't this good? This is fine. It's fine. I wouldn't knock this if I was a supervisor, but a couple of things. This is written very clinically. I doubt that every family would necessarily be on board with this. It sounds too sterile, it sounds too clinical, right? And so another way of phrasing this is, Charlie needs to feel loved by his mother and know that he and his brother come first. That's it, okay? If, if Charlie felt that need, that he was loved, okay, by his mother, all right, then what would happen is he wouldn't need as many coping skills because he wouldn't worry as much. He wouldn't need the marijuana to cope with his feelings of inadequacy, right? He wouldn't need to escape from his environment. And so these become strategies now when you're able to drill this down. All right, good. So if you can write a need statement like this, you can kill it, right? But here's important to understand, the expectation again, let's, let's manage expectations, isn't for you to be here, all right, in one semester of your MSW program. Some of these need statements have taken practitioners months or years to perfect in drilling down to the need. I'm giving you a polished, finished example, right? But if you were to leave this program somewhere close to this or this, as a rap practitioner, I'm telling you, you would impress a lot of folks in the wraparound world. So that's why I wanna share these with you, all right? I know I have thrown a lot at you. 
um, this lesson. I, I appreciate you all for hanging in there and I'm sorry that it's been um, so technical in the terms and in the, in the discussion of, of planning uh, in, in, in regards to wraparound and the gym model, but I want you to always remember you can go back and you can review this material if it's uh, something that, that maybe you wanted to brush up on because maybe you lost some of the content at some point during the, uh, the lecture. But again, I wanna thank you for tuning in and hanging in there, okay? What I'd like to be able to do is go ahead and close us out today, and I'm gonna bring up my timer here with our centering exercise, okay? And so what we are going to do is engage in our centering and try to block out all of those thoughts, those concerns, those worries, that overwhelm that you may be feeling at this point in the program, all right? Our scripture verse to focus on today will come from Psalms 37, uh, uh, verses 30 to 31. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. His tongue, his tongue speaks what is right. God's teaching is in his heart. He's, his steps do not falter. Our scripture focus uh, word for today will be truth, truth. So what does it mean to carry God's teachings in your heart, right? Oftentimes what we know is that our behaviors are as a result of life is what's going on in our heart. We know that our external behavior is a reflection of how we're feeling internally. So what does it mean when we're able, right, to, to breathe, to speak righteousness and wisdom when we know that God's teaching is in our heart? How is God in your heart and how is that presence of God impacting your behavior, right? Something to think about. What does truth mean to you? How is God speaking truth into your heart as you move through this program, as you go about your life, right? Balancing school and work. So for the next two minutes, let's not worry about what's coming before, what's coming after. Let's not worry um, about your assignments. Let's not worry maybe about your job or the hours or your, industry, your practicum placement, right? Let's just focus on the fact that for a moment we're giving that up, right? And we're just listening to how God is speaking wisdom or righteousness into our heart, how God is speaking truth into our hearts. So go ahead and take a nice deep breath, close your eyes, and I will keep track of the time. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes, come on back. Take that nice deep breath, welcome back. Wanna say a big thank yous to you all, <laughs> hang in there. I saw this one, just thought this was funny. So um, I wanna say thank you though, truly to you all. I know you might be feeling a sense of overwhelm at this point in the program, hang in there. You all are doing great, okay? Uh, just be sure to stay on top of Blackboard. Be sure to communicate with me if there's something that's, that's um, uh, making you nervous or anxious, if there's something that you're just not clear on, if you need to spend a little time brushing up on and me explaining a little bit better what these need statements and strategies are, please feel free to do that. You are not bothering me. Know that every morning when I wake up, I am praying for all of you. I'm praying for all of you to continue on, to find the strength uh, and perseverance to continue through this program. You're going to make it to the end, all right? I want to thank you all so very much for your time. I appreciate you all. Take care. Have a good one.